as I was saying, this is not a black hole. This is the eclipse, okay? It was uh, July 2nd uh, this year in the north of Argentina. You went there? Yes. Whoa. <laughs> you see, it was a very, very nice day, not a single cloud, which is very lucky when you want to see an eclipse, right? It was really, really, really special. These are the, Un the Andes Mountains here. It's very <laughs> impressive. So, okay, so first of all, thanks uh, for inviting me again to this. Uh, why, why is the moon not covering the sun? The moon covers the sun, it's just the camera doesn't, uh, has the dynamic range to, 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 to catch this. Yeah. It is a fine tuning, really, yeah. There are eclipses where, they, where, they, where you don't have a full eclipse, even though it is central. Call it annual eclipse. Anyways. I'm not talking about this. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to talk today about uh, some work I've been doing interruptedly over the past two years. Mainly this will be about this, um, uh, this work uh, that's not published yet, and a little bit about this. This one I will actually not cover, okay? All right, so uh, let's start. So this is about um, the flavor puzzle in the standard model, okay? So let's look at what is the problem and then try to solve it. So uh, the standard model has this uh, very hierarchical structures, all of us know, uh, of masses. Uh, these are charged leptons, up quarks and down quarks, uh, mass eigenstates and a logarithmic scale, so they cover many orders of magnitude, hierarchy is largest for the up type quarks and smallest for the down type quarks, okay? Um, okay, technically it's natural, but uh, we could just put these parameters in the standard model, but somehow we think it's unlikely to happen, right? So uh, looking a little bit more closer, closely at the, at the quark sector, we have uh, the Yukawa couplings here now. And once we diagonalize, these are the numerical values at, I think this must be the 1 TV scale, they depend obviously on the scale. Uh, just for illustration, I chose here one particular scale. Maybe that's even the, the lower scale, probably the top is quite large, okay. Now, uh, so once we diagonalize, now we see uh, there are four unitary matrices that enter here in this diagonalization. Only this combination will be observable, that is the CKM matrix which enters in the W coupling. So this is all uh, what you know very well, just uh, uh, reminding ourselves, okay? Uh, so uh, the other thing, it's not only the, uh, the eigenvalues are very hierarchical, but also the CKM matrix, okay? This is a CKM matrix uh, where the entries, absolute values are put to scale in these squares, okay? So you see it's basically diagonal uh, matrix with some small corrections in the uh, one, two, and two, three, and then this, this one is really, really small, okay? Now, um, as I said, it seems quite unlikely that such a behavior occurs purely by chance, okay? And I will be, um, I will be more uh, quantitative about this statement later on, okay? So, but I guess uh, that's something that many people would agree on and it prompted obviously a large number of model building papers on how to create such a structure. Okay. Um, all right, so let's, let's, uh, let's go to um, the first part. So, um, how could we how, how could we get to some to a structure like this? Okay, um, so let's do something completely ad hoc here. Okay, so that was uh, a paper I had about two years ago. Um, so let us um, let us write a matrix as a product of several other matrices n matrices. Okay, let us assume that this could be the Yukawa couplings, for instance. Um, but it's a generic generical mathematical statement. Okay. So once you take these to be random order one matrices, quite independent of what you choose as prior, um, prior distributions to draw these 
uh, matrix elements of these matrices from. So these are supposed to be three by three in this case, but could be uh, any dimension. So, um, so you take them to be order one, for instance, from uniform priors. You could choose other ones. And let's look at what happens if we, um, we diagonalize this, OK? So you would uh, obviously, each, each of these factors will have more or less order one eigenvalues. That is what you would expect. However, it turns out that the product of such, such a kind has a very hierarchical structure, OK? So this one. I didn't put it here. I think that's five or seven of these guys. Okay, so these are the diagonal. The, these are the eigenvalues of the small, medium, and large eigenvalues of the three by three structure of this kind. Okay. All right. There's some analytical understanding of why this why this happens. N is an arbitrary integer. Okay. Here in this case, I choose n equal to five or seven. I don't remember. So this is just an observation. So if you take a matrix and you uh, randomly and you multiply it by another random matrix and another one until you get to your desired number, so then you diagonalize and you plot the spectrum of this product, it gets quite hierarchical. Okay, hierarchically in the sense that the eigenvalues have very different uh, sizes. Okay, so there I have some analytical understanding for that uh, that could be could, I could comment on later on if you like. Okay. I think it, so I think this is five. I think it was five, okay? Uh, very good, so this is for real. Later on I will do complex three by three, okay? For complex it's a bit less, um, less radical, this separation of the eigenvalues, okay? Well, so one way, one rough way to understand this, okay, is that, okay, so you will always have some uh, non-degeneracy in these individual factors. Notice that the eigenvalues will always be a little bit different. And then it turns out that the, that the, um, that the, these, these, um, these individual very, very mild hierarchies in these factors, they tend to add up coherently rather than cancel each other out, okay? And there's some, okay, there, then it gets more technical if you want to know why this is, okay? But there is some, some analytical understanding of this. Okay. Yes, or some question? No, 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 it's not. So these are not even Hermitian, but even if they were Hermitian, it doesn't matter, okay? Non diagonal. So you could think if they are diagonal and all diagonal simultaneously, obviously the hierarchies would. would you would never get one. So the hierarchies would, would always uh, increase if you multiply it. But here, even they are completely randomly oriented, and somehow they, they're like, uh, so the, actually the, the cases where the, these hierarchies cancel out, no, where you have, maybe you can understand it that way, no, where you have the, let's look at these two factors. Let's, let's put y1 by 2 by 3 and y1 by 2 by 3 here. So the, the, the orientations where you have to multiply y1 by, by 3 is rather special. So you have to have a, Unitary matrix in between. Okay, it's getting a bit too technical uh, uh, without showing actually, <coughs> excuse me, equations. Yeah. So this is a subset of the linear. Matrix, right? linear is that for very large matrix? No, I think you are thinking of uh, no. That's about not product. No, they were lo just looking at very large. Okay. Yeah. Large no, no, these are products. This is something rather special. Okay. Okay, so this seems something nice to maybe take advantage of. Okay. So let me just, one more thing here um, just to emphasize. So this is a case where I put n equals 7, again, for the real case. Um, and here is just one representative. And what I, I want to show this because the actual elements are not small, OK, or not hierarchical. They are all of the same order, more or less, no? 0.5, let's say. However, the matrix is very degenerate, if you, if you can visualize by, for instance, normalizing each column to its first entry. So you get very much a rank one matrix, okay? So the, it's not that somehow the matrix elements themselves become hierarchical, it's just the eigenvalues, okay? So the eigenvalues in this case are down here. Okay, so despite the entries remaining order one, the matrix becomes quickly very degenerate, okay? Now, um, there's another thing that we have to 
to, to figure out, which is the, the alignment, no, the CKM alignment. So how can we obtain alignment necessary for the CKM matings to become approximately diagonal? And that's actually something which is uh, independent of what just said. This can be done in the following way. If we put the down and up, like if you, if you factorize them in such a way, and if these uh, two factors are the same and themselves have a hierarchical spectrum, that is necessary and so, well, at least sufficient, let's say, for the left-handed rotations to be aligned in such a way that the CKM matrix becomes diagonal. So this is not something really new, I would say. Uh, this is something that is actually the basis also of Frogart Nielsen models and so on. Maybe if you don't see it right away or extra dimensional models, the same thing. If you don't see this right away, wait a little bit, I will, I will go into much in much more detail later on, okay? So, but this is a generic uh, property. So what you have to have is that um, the Yukawas factorized in such a way that they have a common hierarchical factor, okay? Good, so one could think of, okay, so then the obvious choice would be if you want to use the previous, um, the previous uh, observation, you could do something like this. No? So you have a NQ matrices, which are common here, and ND and NU different matrices on the right-hand side, which, which you know, complete the, the spectrum, let's say. Okay? So but this is the culprit here for having the CKM alignment. Okay, so, but of course, what I'm saying, what I write here, this is not a complete model, okay? This is just a parameterization using two facts, okay? And the two facts, they will be important for the actual models that I will put, uh, present now. But the actual, the two, the two facts now are what I said previously in the previous uh, page. We get products from products of random matrix, we get hierarchical eigenvalues. And seek the alignment we get from this common hierarchical factor on the left, okay? If we had the common hierarchical factor on the right, you would get right in that alignment, but that is, um, let's say, unobservable, no? Completely random. Exactly. So these are, we may need to build a model where somehow they, they appear like this, okay, these common factors. Can you say a, a hierarchical common factor? I mean, how do you choose the Y1, Q, uh, the, first, the first one? How do I choose it? So, um, uh, okay, so this depends on your model, no? Um, so, for instance, in Frogard Nielsen, you would put this epsilon to some power, a diagonal matrix. This would be diagonal, okay? And it would be epsilon to some power, okay? And then in the second epsilon to some power, some power. But this will be the same matrix as this, okay? There's so this, this will be in this. Are there are already hierarchies built in. So they can come from any, from any possible uh, source, okay? They could come from this, okay? So there's, uh, these are the two, two ingredients, okay? So as I said, this is not a model, okay? <laughs> Let's do model. So um, one possibility is to use enzyme models, okay? Actually, the actual models, as you will see now, are a little bit more complicated than a simple idea. They're not always uh, uh, of the simple kind that, are, that appeared on the previous transparency. But the, the, the two main ingredients are the same, yeah? The, the product, the, the hierarchy from products and the common hierarchical factor in the, CK, in the, in the quark sector. So this is... Uh, mainly now based on this paper that's going to appear, okay? Um, there's also some related ideas, so enzyme models have been used um, in other ways to, let's say, create, uh, create uh, flavor hierarchies. Now, what, what am I going to do is I start, this is supposed to symbolize the Yukawa Lagrange, you have the Higgs field, the up and down quarks, and the left-handed doublet, so this would be the standard model, Yukawa sector for the quarks. And now what we do is we add to the, oops, we add to this um, a vector-like 
quark, and we couple them with these three by three matrices. So these are always three by uh, uh, three quarks and three quarks. So the uh, generations are repeated here. So these uh, coupling matrices here, which are, have dimension of mass, okay, they are three by three matrices, and we will take them to be random, okay? Because in the absence of any, you know, additional structure, the best we can do is to say, okay, let's say they are of, they are, they are, let's say, of, of order one in, in terms of some scale, okay? There's an implicit scale here. Um, so some of them are called K, some of course them are called M, that is, but they're really both mass. Sometimes they are called mixings and sometimes they are called masses, but you know, it's, it really doesn't matter. So now you repeat the game, okay? You add another one and you always, the important point is you keep this chain, yeah? So only keep, you only keep, uh, couple one to the next, to the next, to the next, and don't couple, let's say, this to that, et cetera, okay? This kind of structure can be enforced by symmetries. Now, this is the, uh, the clockwork idea. And um, for now, they are complex mass matrices, three by three. So it means I didn't want to, I didn't write the Lagrange, maybe I should have, no? So each of them, the left and right, can couple to each other via a mass mixing. Let's call it a mass mixing, okay? And these are these three by three matrices. Arbitrary for now, okay? You will see that the actual uh, dimension for Lagrange that I get from this is independent of the scale of this. Yeah? And the, are the, same. the same of the standard model. That's the important part. So the quantum numbers are repeated. These are vector-like copies of of that guy, okay? Now, okay. So then you do that until your n side. So this is called an n side model or clockwork model. It's kind of uh, has been. A, we rediscovered in many ways, okay? Um, it's all the same gauge structure. How do you prevent? Uh, yeah, so you have to you have to you have to uh, start to, to to write symmetries, no? So there are symmetries that depend on the sides, and they are broken by these sporions, okay? So you 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 have in mind a larger symmetry group, and these these couplings here they are charged under this symmetry group. A, lar a larger gauge symmetry. No, it's, it can be global, yeah. It's gonna be. Can be global, can be gauged, can be so gauged. Some really huge global symmetry. Yeah, your, yeah, yeah. And, and then you break it global. So, so this is the clockwork idea. This is, uh, this is nothing. Uh, okay. Nothing. Of my own thinking. Okay. So now what we'll do is um, actually I think one can in a, in a way also build a model where you give up this. Okay, but this is something I haven't done yet. You can also couple, let's say more randomly, yeah, okay. Now, um, what's happening is that the, um, so that's I said already, you know, the KM matrix, I will take random, and we repeat this for the up sector, so there will be a blue chain here and a green chain here, okay? Up sector on the down sector. So the camera's still following me here. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, the, the one, one could simply now, we have a big, Mass matrix, no, for for the for these vector-like quarks, it's not completely vector. -like. There's, there's three chiral zero modes, no, because we have three more left-handed fields than right-handed fields. Okay, this goes from one to n, it goes from zero to n, and each of the, these lobs represents three. So you have three zero modes just by counting chirality here. Okay, so we could we could simply diagonalize this big matrix, and this can be done. Okay, and and write. Uh, how the zero mode, so they couple all the heavy modes, and how the zero mode ends up coupling here. This can be done analytically. A simpler way of doing this, it also helps us to find the dimension six corrections to this, is to integrate out these vector-like guys that are not mass eigenstates, okay? So solving the equation of motion for these guys and plugging them back into the Lagrange, so this gives you a modification, so if you, integrate out the last guy, this gives you a modification of the kinetic term of the next guy, okay? It can only modify this guy's couplings because this is the only guy that was coupled to this vector like um, uh, doublet, okay? And so you get a, a simple expression for these, um, 
for the for the wave function normalization due to this extra extra integrated out degree of freedom. So this one is of course is the original part, and then you get something which is this combination of these matrices. Okay. And you get higher dimensional operators that I didn't write. They agree with higher dimensional operators because I didn't use uh, okay in this mass eigenstates here. Okay. Yeah, okay, so this is correct. In principle, you could also think of having these uh, uh, having these um, gauged or something, no? Where I have some tower yeah, yeah, sort of yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. states. Could, you could have this, you could have this, yeah. <laughs> As I said, I, I'm thinking also about uh, giving up this idea of the, of the, the, the clock, or maybe towards the end of the um, talk, I will, I, I, will, I will comment on this, so... I, one could try to think of coupling completely arbitrarily, okay? Um, or at least moderately arbitrarily, let's say, okay? But that's so what's sort of the scales, I guess, that appear in the Ks and, in the K's and M's, these mass matrices? What's the... Okay, we'll, we'll come to that. I'll have okay. a... Yeah, uh, yeah. So mainly, you will, you will integrate them out. Uh, you will also get some flavor-changing processes. So this, will, this will limit them. Was that your question? Well, I just wanted to know where are things. Okay, so, so, so this, obviously, you see, whatever the scalars cancels out, you this Q matrix is dimensionless. So for, for the, from that point of view, I have no, I can, I can, they can put, 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 be the Planck scale, they can put the, be the TV scale. No, there's no, or anything in between. But of course, you will also get these high dimensional operators, and they will give some bounds. And typically, you, there should be at least a TV. Okay. Here comes. So now you, you continue, you get the recursion relation, and you can, you can do this all the way to your original guy, and then you get the original Lagrangian here, and they're only, so this is unmodified, these couplings are modified, these C are the original couplings that I wrote here, and you get a wave function normalization for these, uh, for these uh, left-handed fields here, which is this kind of geometric sum of these matrices, okay? Now you can already see that there are some products of random matrices appearing here, but of course it's a bit different of what I had previously, okay? Still these matrices are, are pretty, pretty hierarchical as, we show, as I show now, okay? Um, but this is basically, this is the, 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 the matrix that one should, if you want to do it properly, you should uh, use this matrix here in this, uh, in this kinetic term, you can then normalize canonically, and the, the inverse of this will appear in the Yukawa couplings. Okay. So, so as, as you do this, sometimes you probably accidentally get light vector-like quarks. Mm -hmm. so yes. I guess in the you have to be careful of that. Space, no, so you know, how, very good, how very good. Do I have to say, ah, I'm going to cut that out because it gave me? Gave yeah. Okay. So, a very good question. So, if you if you if you simulate this in principle, you get these cases where sometimes you get a very light guy. No. Yeah. But uh, I think, so these are, in these simulations, are very rare cases, okay? So either you go by hand and throw them out, if you do a real simulation, or you just say, okay, it's a very small measure, okay? That's a very good point, yeah. And of course, depends on the, this depends, this, the extra masses do depend, obviously, on this mass case. Sorry, yeah? Yes, yes, and the Cs also, okay? Qs have a, okay, Qs. Look like this, okay? So this is the, the this is so this is our recursion relation, no? So the z the wave function of the i minus first guy depends on the z i, on the ith guy, no? And they get multiplied by these q matrices, okay? And that gives you this strange this 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 sum. So this is a distribution. This is now with complex matrices, for instance, where I put uh, where I put k and m in this case. So there's one neg uh, inverse factor, one regular factor. So you get in this log scale sort of something um, symmetric for the eigenvalues, okay? So you have some eigenvalues that are around one, this yellow curve, some that are a bit bigger than one, some that are a bit smaller than one, okay? Something expected, I would say, no? If you have such a structure here, kind of symmetric in this log scale. Now, um, oh yeah, I'm going quite slowly, okay. <laughs> So now, once you do, so if you look at this recursion relation here, 
So if the zi was already a little bit hierarchical, then you multiply with these a little bit hierarchical matrices. So this will become, this will, as I said previously, will enlarge the hierarchy due to this product structure, okay? Okay, then of course the difference that you add one here, no? And this one, what will, will it do? It will take the, it will not influence very large eigenvalues. So that's the unit matrix here, no? But it will, it will kind of wipe out very small eigenvalues, okay? So this matrix Z, the, the Z0 for the, after I integrate out everything, will have to be, uh, we expect to have some eigenvalues of order one and some very large eigenvalues and some in the middle, okay? But not small eigenvalues, obviously. They always, they, all the eigenvalues are larger than one. Now, um, what you have to do is, you have to actually calculate Z minus one half, okay, which is the matrix that will appear in the Giocava couplings after canonical normalization, correct? And this is the distribution for the Z minus one half. I think I didn't put it here. I think this is for N equal seven again or something like that, okay? So now you have this very large peak uh, that comes from this one basically, okay? And you have some very, very, some broad distribution of some rather small eigenvalues. So that's the peak here is a tantalum is one over a thousand or something like that, or one thousand, five thousand, something like that, okay? So these are, um, these come from the, these are very small eigenvalues that came from the very large eigenvalues in this matrix, okay? And another feature, yeah? Oh, you know, no, this is all dimensionless. This Q matrix is, uh, look, the, the, I will, okay, at this point, I take the K and M matrices of the same scale, okay? Of order one, in terms of one scale, but the scale I take the same. So this is dimensionless, okay? Everything is dimensionless. Z is dimensionless, Q is dimensionless, epsilon is dimensionless, okay? So this doesn't, so at this point, this doesn't depend on the scale, on the overall scale. So now you get these, uh, these, these distributions, no? And, okay, so, despite the fact that these Z matrices and these epsilon matrices are not exactly products, the fact that this product structure appears in this recursion relation, again, gives you a separation of the eigenvalues, okay? It's the same, the same idea as, as at the beginning of the talk. It's just a bit more complicated. So, okay, so you can, uh, you can do something, um, okay, so now we have to normalize canonically, and also we write this, we define these, these, these matrices here, and they will appear in the Yukawa couplings, right? Okay, so first thing to notice is from the Q chain, from the doublet chain, you get these common hierarchical factors here, okay? So this will guarantee that you get a diagonal more or less CKM matrix. And then you get these other green and blue factors, they are different, also hierarchical, no? All right, so what you could do is, okay, let's, let's do something, let's go, let's switch to a basis where these epsilon matrices are diagonal. That's a um, gauge invariant uh, diagonalization, right? You rotate the Qs, you rotate, now we only have the zero mode, right? Now we have only this one mode. So we rotate the, uh, the Q field, you rotate the U field, you rotate the D field, okay? Um, this gives you a new basis, okay? And now the Yokawa couplings have this structure, okay? Where these are the eigenvalues of these matrices here. And now, this is very familiar structure, no? No, 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 no. The Cs are proto Yokawa couplings. They are order one. They are order one dimensionless numbers, okay? Yeah. The interaction, which one? This one. These ones. This is the original field. I have not touched at all this field, okay? I've only integrated out the others. So this one remains from the start. It's, uh, this is unmodified by the integrating out procedure before I normalize canonically. Only this modified, okay? <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So really, this field is not the actual zero mode. I call it an interpolating field. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with um, extra-dimensional models, no? 
sometimes in, instead of use, working with a zero mode, it's useful to work with the brain value of the field, okay? It's the same idea, okay? This could be called the brain value of the field, the boundary value. It's really the zero. This zero means here side zero, not mass zero, okay? Um, okay, so this epsilon parameters can be interpreted now as the, the mixing of the zero mode to the boundary field, okay? And they become hierarchical, no? So there are some fields which have a, uh, order one mixing with the boundary field, with the, with the boundary zero where the Higgs lives, and some fields which have little mixing, okay? And of course, the idea is that the ones that have little mixing becomes the light quarks, light leptons, and the ones that have more mixing become the heavier fields, okay? So sorry, when you drew the picture before, that two zero is not really the original two zero. That's some um, big superposition of, of stuff that, that no, used to live out in your... Uh, this Q0? Yeah, yeah. This Q0 is the original Q0. However, it's used... This is not a mass Einstein state, really, yeah? but you, you, have, you have integrated out, it's a bit of a mathematical trick, I would say, you have integrated out non-mass Einstein states. You can also integrate out mass Einstein states, okay? Is this... uh, sorry, usually if I, mm -hmm. if I'm, I'm trying to sort of connect yeah, to yeah. You know, an extra dimensional okay. picture, I, and you know, very often the, you know, the, the zero mode is not localized. Uh, if I just throw in sort of random matrices, uh, uh -huh. is it usually the case that I'm going to get my zero mode is kind of living everywhere. Uh, it's, this is a very, very good point, and it, is a, it will answer this at the end of my talk if I have time, okay? okay. There is actually, it is actually localized. It is randomly localized, and that's very counterintuitive, okay? Yeah, okay. okay, if you, I don't know, I will, I will, I will, I will leave you <laughs> confused for the time being, yeah? <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is not local, okay, so we'll, we will come to that, okay? So the fact, though, that these, some of these epsilon parameters are small, kind of hint towards the fact that they should be localized away from the, from the boundary, you know, because otherwise this epsilon parameter should be one, okay? Okay, so, so okay, then you get, these are the usual relations that you get from such a structure. B virtually all um, models of flavor can be in some, way or another put into this form, be it the frogart nielsen be it the extra dimension, be it the, uh, what is this called, flavorful supersymmetry, you know, these sequestered models of strong coupling, uh, et cetera, no? All of them, they can be brought, and the only difference is what, how, you, how, how do you interpret these, these epsilon factors, okay? So the point is that you have these epsilon factors for the Qs, which, which give you the CKM matrix, basically in this form. So these, these relations here, when I put just one tilde, means up to order one numbers, yeah? So the eigen values are E1, E1, E2, E2, E3, E3, okay? Up to order one numbers. These are known relations, so this can be shown analytically, okay? I will, I just put this up here because I guess many people might be, or not, I don't know, familiar with these formula, okay? Good. Um, anything else I wanted to say here? So let's come to, okay, so I'm running really late, but let's go. So this is important kind of. So what we could do is if the, if we, if, we, if now we talk about the scales, if the, um, if the matrices K come at a different scale, oh, sorry, I skipped this. If the matrices K come at a different scale as the matrices N, then in this big sum that I wrote previously, you could say that the last term dominate because the Q matrices are kind of having large entries, okay? They're kind of large, large numbers. So if, if, we, if, we, if we have this case here where the K matrices come at a much higher scale than the M matrices, okay? Uh, then you can, you can just simplify the analysis considerably. So you have your Z matrices are now simply a, a product. You normalize canonically. And this time, your, um, your carvers look like this, where the epsilons are really just products of these Q matrices, okay? And that is a special case, you know? I mean, that is really a new ingredient. We impose that the scales are different. Previously, I was taking the same scale, which dropped out, okay? 
Here, I was taking different scales. So the ratio of scales matters in this, obviously, the ratio of scales matters from this formula here. Sorry? It should, this should just stay above one. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this will, the terms that I didn't write here, they ensure that it is always above one. There's always at the beginning one, but these will be very huge. You know, so they will be all. Huh? No, no, no. These Z matrices will have very large eigenvalues, and then the, 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 this epsilon matrices will have very small eigenvalues. So, not sure if, if I understand your question. You're right that I didn't write all these subleading terms here, but these subleading terms ensure that these matrices have eigenvalues larger than one, and these matrices have eigenvalues smaller than one. Okay? Make sense? So now I didn't just, I put this for two reasons. The first reason is that it makes very evident the connection to the very beginning of the talk, where the Yukawas have, have really this form of a product. So if you plug this in here, you have a product of matrices, and you have a common factor that is a product of matrices, okay? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So that is input here, okay? Now, that, uh, this is actually interesting for, for model building purposes also. And the reason is we can look at what happens if we put these, if we separate these scales, which we can model by simply putting a parameter xi here, which is larger than one, okay? These matrices pick up a factor of xi. So if you put xi equal two or three, you get this. So this shader region, hard to see, was the original distribution. There's two effects. The first effect is that, I, sit, I listed here as a second effect, is that you kind of separate the blue and the yellow curve, yeah? So you actually increase a little bit the hierarchy, which, which I call second and third generation, yeah? So the blue and yellow curve gets separated. So for instance, the dashed line, actually this is wrong, this is the other way around here, yeah? So the dashed line is psi equal two, okay? So you see, if you look at these two peaks, uh, they get separated. This is, uh, okay. Whereas, the, for instance, the green and the, the yellow peak, if you look at the green, it's very hard to see, and the yellow peak, the original ones, let's say the location of the maxima, the relative location, does not get changed very much. Okay? That's the one effect, and that's interesting because in some way, many, many times you want a little bit of a bigger hierarchy between second and third generation. Okay? So this original cycle one case sometimes gives you a, a very narrow uh, hierarchy only between second and third and a big hierarchy between second and first generation, okay? So you're new hierarchy. I, am, I am introducing new hierarchy. You can do it without, I will show some cases, okay? So, um, so we enlarge the hierarchy between second and third generation and we shift all the eigenvalues to smaller values, no? That is the second effect. You shift all the eigenvalues. And that's interesting, obviously, because you will, you will not, if, unless you do something about, the, about this very peaked distribution around one, you will not be able to generate the bottom mass or the tau mass, okay? So this is one way of generating bottom or tau mass introducing a parameter psi greater than one. But the main intergenerational hierarchy still comes from this product, I would say, okay? even though the second and third generations are also separated. Sorry? Yeah, two, but they, you will see they will be larger than two because it depends also, okay, I will, you, will, you, will, you will need order 10, okay? Five to 10 is not quite order one anymore. In the, in, in, okay, you will see this, I'll do the simulations now. Okay, what I, I'm going to do is uh, I do a numerical simulation. You, you, you roll the dice, no? You make, the, um, you make a distribution. Uh, so you, you put some uniform priors for, in, for, the, for the complex uh, entries of these matrices, okay? And um, you calculate the distribution of the eigenvalues and mixings. And this is supposed to symbolize this distribution, okay? Up to now, there's no input from experiment. This is just whatever your values for the ends and the size of what your parameters are of this model, the non-stochastic parameters, now you get a distribution, okay? So there are only, the only non-stochastic parameters here are this number of years 
there are five numbers in principle for the five types of standard model fields. And this Xi parameter is in principle also five. Okay, they will be reduced in a bit. So you get some, so this, this, this plot here is supposed to symbolize this distribution. Yeah, these are the contours of the distribution. Now the experimental ellipse will be much, much smaller ellipse. Okay, it can be considered a point here and will appear somewhere inside in this, in this plane also, okay? And then we can, uh, ignoring this experimental errors, we can just ask where does this experimental point sit in this distribution, okay? How many sigmas is it away from the center, which is the, let's say, the maximum of the distribution, okay? That question I want to ask. To answer, the, to answer really the question, how typical are these experimental values, no, that we measure? in terms of this, uh, this model. The mass? Masses, so yeah, we'll have 19 parameters, something like that. There's the, the quark masses, three quark masses, the three, uh, sorry, the six quark masses, the three charged lepta masses, the CKM angles, the, the jars clock invariants for the, the CP, violation. CP violation, yeah, everything, okay? So let's do the quarks first. So, um, as I said, six mass, three angles, one phase. Um, overall, there's some tension that one has to, that one encounters. I'll probably skip the details on this. But uh, the overall, it's very easy to achieve less than one sigma, okay? But careful, this one sigma has nothing to do with experimental sigma, okay? This is just the sigma of my distribution. So, let's do some examples. So this I call scenario A, which I, for, to reduce the parameters, I put n u and in q equal and xi u and xi q equal, okay? I, the reason I do this is that naively this would be compatible with SU5 unification, okay? Now, um, if you do this, so you see the, the you, can, you can look, you can, for each of these choices of the n's, no? Is it, you see these are not very large values. You can, um, you can optimize, for instance, the Xi parameters, okay? There's now two continuous parameters, and that's the typical chi-squared for these 10 degrees of freedom that you, that, you, that you get, okay? And this corresponds to about a one sigma. Again, nothing to do with the experimental sigma. I'm not claiming here that I predict the, the experimental values up to within, <laughs> within their errors. No, that would be ridiculous. I'm just saying that how, clo how, how good does my... Um, uh, my, my model perform in terms of uh, how typical are the, are the experimental values, how typically fall they in the, in the <coughs> theoretical distributions, okay? This is total chi-square, so never 10. 10, 10. Yeah. So you, you'll see the plots later on, and by AI you can see that it's one sigma, okay? So there's another scenario where, uh, for instance, for, 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 for some reason I put psi u equal to 1, basically, because because, <laughs> again, I have two free parameters. It's a little bit different. I get similar values, okay? So it's a bit different. I didn't want to keep too many free continuous parameters, okay? It's not very easy to minimize this numerically. An interesting uh, other case is what I call the two Higgs doublet model. What do I do here? I introduce a second Higgs doublet, and I put a large tangent beta like you would have in the MSSM. So this gives you a possibility to put all these psi parameters equal to one, okay? Because this can be used in order to generate the bottom or tau mass, okay? For large tangent beta, you get the bottom or tau mass with your Kava couplings of order one, okay? So this is really a model, this red model is really a model, you see that the chi-squared is similar, where you really get everything from this, uh, from this random separation of the eigenvalues due to the products, okay? There is no small parameter anymore. Everything is order one, okay? Except this parameter, obviously, okay? So this is something that you cannot get away with, obviously, you know? Just for fun, let's do the same for the standard model. Let's, let's ask the question that was when I announced earlier that we wanted to do the same for the standard model. So um, how unlikely is the standard model to reproduce the observed masses at mixing? Well, that is the case where all the ends are equal zero and obviously they're no psi parameters. Random Yukawa couplings. So I just roll the dice random order one, okay? 
You can do again these two cases with a second or without a second Higgs doublet, and you get rather large values for the chi square. It's expected, no? But you know, it's, it's what I said at the beginning. We expect um, this to be a very unlikely scenario. Unlikely scenario. This is why we start working at this in the first on this in the first place, no? Because we want to we believe that this should not happen by chance, and this is tells it tells you how much it does not happen by chance, okay? And you can compare these values and say, okay, so these models, obviously, they are much more likely to reproduce the observed masses and mixings. Here are the plots for some particular case. Sorry, that was, I believe, the first green one, okay, that had the lowest chi-squared. Um, and you can see the experimental values, which are these vertical lines, fall reasonably well into the marginalized distributions here. Okay, so these are the up, these are the, sorry, these are the down type masses, these are the up type masses, these are the CKM angles, and this is the just the CP violation, okay? So you can already buy IC that nowhere you get one away by more than one sigma, okay? But of course, this one sigma is a 10 dimensional one sigma, no? So this would be a little different from the, from the standard deviation in this marginalized distribution, okay? Okay, so I guess there's not much to say. This is just for illustration. Um, what about the strong CP phase? The strong CP phase. Um, well, it's strong CP problem. I, I don't solve here, no? Yeah. No. I'm just curious, you know, where does, where does that, that phase... So you should call... You should arc that, that, that uh, M dagger M, no? You should, should compute this. I have not. That, it that, will be that, large. It will be large. No, it will be too large. Uh, good question. I will, I will check it. Okay. Leptons. Uh, for the leptons, I use um, nine degrees of freedom. I used also the seesaw mechanism to get the neutrino masses. You know, otherwise, you know, as I said previously, this mechanism is very good at separating intergenerational hierarchies, but not so great at, you know, separating the actual, uh, you know, um, different representation from each other. Okay. That's why we had the tangent beta or these large psi parameters. And this, for, for this reason, for the neutrinos, I, I use the seesaw. And, okay, you can do the same thing. This is for the, for the lepton sector. You have scenario A. This is completely fixed by the quark sector here, okay? So there's no free parameters. Everything I did in the quark, I just copy because I wanted to be roughly SU5 compatible, okay? At, Good. So you can observe this here. The L, NL is very small, two or three, okay? This is enough for this uh, to happen, while the NQ, oops, the NQ, that makes the, the stronger CK mixing, okay? The weaker CK mixing. So the low number, so you cannot go to more than three. Yeah? It, becomes, it becomes worse, as you can see, but it's not very bad, no? So the, the thing is, the distributions become quickly very broad. That also helps you, right? That, for that reason, you, once you add ends, these distributions become very broad, and then you can basically, you don't lose any chi-squared, okay? Scenario B, where I put CL like one, works similarly. The 2 x double model works similarly. The, 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 there's less tension in general in the lepton sector than it is in, than it is in the quark sector, so there is the, 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 the chi-squared is very, very low, okay? You can do, again, uh, the standard model. You get large values, but this comes entirely from the, from, in this case, comes entirely from the charged lepton masses, okay? The neutrino sector you could do completely randomly, and that's actually something well known, okay? It's called neutrino anarchy. So, uh, predict the phase of the uh, deceleration of the spectrum? Predict? No, but they get a distribution. <laughs> no, but you see, with a certain. <laughs> well, that's a jazz cock. I should have put probably the distribution for the. Actually, the distribution for the phase is very flat. If you put the distribution for the, fl for the phase, I did put here the distribution for the jazz cock, but if you put the distribution for the phase, it's completely flat, okay? But you see, I mean, they, 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 I didn't, this, 
I don't know which one that was, which case, but you see, uh, you see here, no, that's what I said previously, the angles, they are kind of, this is sine squared theta, okay? They become very broad, so you can fit anything, okay? But I'm not, I'm not claiming I want to, want to predict very accurately the, the masses or mixings. I just want to get a very typical, I want to make the experimental values a typical case of this, of this approach, okay? Mm -hmm. guys. So for this, this is these n c n o. For the two x doublet model, you need more because you need to separate the second and third generation. So that means, so you saw that you saw that the second and third generation had very little uh, hierarchy for small values of n. So you need to increase this. So the quarks are still in the regime of asymptotic freedom. Good question. So you will lose asymptotic freedom at some point, no? Well, you, what you lose is well, well you, you lose you lose. Yeah, yeah. So I think at some point one should st talk about in more detail about the lambda poles. No, you you will add you add lots of you let this is always you, too much stuff. You've lost you, some you will freedom. at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, sh I think you do. Yeah, I think you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also with SU two. Also with everything, everything it gets you get add too much matter because you multiply this by three. Also, no, remember, yeah, yeah. you multiply this by three because there are three generations. Yeah. So there is a cutoff. There is somewhere a cutoff because of that. No. Okay, so uh, I'm getting very uh, behind. So do you want to hear about FCNC about, oh, well, I have some time, okay? Sorry? Ah. <laughs> and I know, the, I know where the restaurants are. Okay. <laughs> so FCNC constraints very quickly. Actually, this is the part that is still in progress. So I cannot quite see this, this, this clock is five minutes, okay. This is when things go anarchic. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay, so FCNC constraints, right? Um, this is what I said is still a bit in progress. So maybe I can go quite quickly over this. Um, so we do an effective uh, operator approach. We calculate uh, the coefficients all the, of all these dimension six operators. There's some tree level, these all these at tree level, you only get uh, two fermion operators, okay? Because you have only fermionic um, new physics states. So this is the operators that you get. And uh, like people like to do in, in extra dimensions, it's good to write them in terms of these mixing parameters and the mass scales of the vector-like fields. In this case, in the case of the extra dimension, it would be the KK mass. Here, it's the mass of these vector-like guys, okay? And the third parameter that appears here is this C parameter, which is one mostly, except for the tangent beta case where it's one, where it's one over tangent beta for the down and one for the up, okay? All right, so uh, yeah, I should, I should not go into detail here. So at loop, you get more, you get dipole operators, plenty of dipole operators that you can estimate in the same way. And you got a whole bunch of four Fermi operators, but only at the loop level, okay? In contrast to the extra dimension models, which spin one resonances, you would get, you will get those guys at the tree level. So that's an important difference. Okay, so then I will, I'll be very quick because I want to talk a little bit about the, um, the other question that you asked with the localization, okay? So there's one, so I give two examples, one, both in the lepton sector. The one is mu to E conversion. That is this diagram here. So this red dot is one of these um, dimension six tree level operators after you put the Higgs to its VEF. Now this gives you a mu EZ, this is a Z boson here, mu EZ coupling, which is flavor violating, okay? Okay, so what you get is typically, and depending a little bit on the scenario, which is the value of, of this parameter, whether it's one or versus one over tangent beta, um, you get bounds of the order of 10 or 1 TV, okay, for these scales of the vector-like leptons. Another obvious one is this is loop, okay, this is mu to e gamma from these dipole operators, and you get what well, the behavior with, uh, with these parameters is a bit different, but again, you get 1 TV in the best case, okay? And then there will be many, many... Um, four fermion operators, okay, which are generated a loop and which should generate delta F equal to uh, uh, 
observables, no, like KK bar mixing, etc. But they come at loop in contrast to the extra-dimensional models. Okay, so here I still, I'm still, I, I'm still working a little bit on on this, yeah. But the bounds in these in these two, two previous bounds from the mu to e conversion and from the mu to e gamma are very much in the ballpark of the extra-dimensional models, uh, because the structure of the of the couplings of the effective operators are very similar. And basically, also in the extra-dimensional models, you get contributions from vector-like uh, KK modes. Okay. Um, but for this other observable, for delta f equal to, it will be very different because here you always get only get everything at the loop level. Okay. It has due to this c e to the fourth power here. So basically. You can even see it's uh, <laughs> it's CE to the fourth power or this mass to the fourth power. So you can put the 40 either here or here. So it's because essentially the whole Yukawa coupling becomes suppressed due to the um, due to tangent beta, okay? And this appears here. By the way, it comes indirectly also because what I have done in this formula, I have fixed some of the parameters such that I get the correct masses and mixings, okay? That's important, obviously, yeah? So this leaves as three parameters, this CE and this epsilon. Okay. Yes, so I eliminate some of the parameters by the, by the experimental values. For instance, here, what I... You remember there were these mixing parameters epsilon L and epsilon E for the two type of uh, fields that we have, the doublets and the singlets, no? Left-handed doublets, right-handed singlets. So the right-handed singlets mixing parameters I have fixed um, in terms, I've eliminated, let's say, I've not fixed them, I've eliminated them in terms of the physical masks and mixings, and this gives you this formula, okay? It's something that people like to do also in the extra-dimensional models, no? Not sure. Is it, is it clear? My, or that? Okay. There's some implicit parameter fixing in here. Okay. So now let's come to the last part. Uh, I only need five minutes for this, so maybe it's, uh, we can do that. Localization properties. Okay. So let's simplify everything. Let's consider a one-generation clockwork or a one-generation chain of vector-like fermions. Okay, um, so there are no matrices anymore, but we want to know uh, where does the zero mode end up, okay, at which boundary, maybe in the bulk, etc. okay. So in the standard clockwork, so there you have also these, now these, these matrices M and, M and K become just parameters M and K, and uh, this matrix cube is just the ratio of the two parameters. Um, so in the standard Lagrangian of clockwork that people use, um, these are uh, site independent, no? They are site independent and deterministic. You just choose this Q parameter to be something less than one or small, more than one, okay? But it's the same in every site. So this leads to this following localization of zero mode. So when Q is less than one, you can com compute the wave function for the zero mode analytically, and you get something like this. Okay, so now I have not only computed the mixing to the zero side, but also the mixing to the first, second, and there's an analytic formula. And this you can call, if you like, the wave function, okay? If you think of a discretized extra dimension, this is also really the wave function that you get from solving the equation of motion, right? So it's like e to the minus m k i. Where exactly, I like exactly. So it's... So this is a, this is a, actually this is one, this is Q squared, that's Q cubed, that's Q4, and so on. So then this is, you, you can translate it into that if you have, so there are, there are extra dimensional versions of the clockwork model. I'm not sure if it's really exponential, but people call, call it exponential localization, yeah? But this is just by solving, uh, you know, the, the diagonalization problem, finding this, the, the eigenvector. This is the eigenvector, no, of the, of the zero mode. Um, I should have put zero mode wave function here, yeah? If Q is larger than one, then it is the opposite. It appears on the other side. And if you imagine that you had your um, Higgs living here, no, you have a very little coupling of the zero mode to the Higgs. So 
these, these dots, this dot here and this dot here would be my epsilon parameters, which I call epsilon, okay? The, the mixing of the zero mode to the zero side, okay? Or the, the, in terms of extra dimension language, the, the value of the wave function of the zero mode at the brain where the Higgs is. Um, so this values of the, after normalizing, no, this uh, coupling determines at the end, or this value determines at the end whether you have a, a small Yukawa or a large Yukawa, okay? Again, this is one, that one generation, yeah, just to simplify things. So now I call this the uniform or ordered clockwork or inside model, you could call it, keep it calling it the inside model. Um, because these, uh, these guys are deterministic and uniform, they're the same at all the sides. Now, what we can do is we put them randomly, okay? So just as I put these matrices M and K randomly, we can put these now, this one by one matrices, this M and K randomly, these parameters randomly, okay? So now they depend on the side. Um, and what you find is the following. So you can still calculate the wave function analytically for the zero mode, not for the higher modes, but for the zero mode, it's easy to calculate it analytically. And you can, you, you, it becomes a function of these QIs, of, the, of n different parameters, QIs, okay? And for some values of these QIs, it looks like this. And for others, it looks like this. But the most important feature of this is, and I guess this was also uh, first observed by Craig and Sutherland uh, two years ago, uh, that these um, wave functions here are very narrowly localized around the site where, where they are maximal, okay? So there is a, there's somewhere there's a maximum, for instance, why there's a maximum on, on site two, but already on site n and three, it's smaller and then it becomes um, smaller and smaller, okay? And the same is true for, the, for any localization. So you have still uh, all possible localizations. Now you have all possible localizations, but they, they are kind of narrowly uh, peaked, okay? And that's something that has been pointed out in this paper here. Uh, what is known from, from, um, from certain one or even two dimensional uh, Hamiltonians uh, uh, in so-called Anderson tight binding models, okay? So I guess I don't have time to, and I didn't prepare any talks for, for this. Uh, I just wanted to mention it because it was uh, nicely explained in this, in this paper. And it is, <laughs> it is basically the same, uh, same reason. So I have some analytical understanding. I can, tell, I, can, I can calculate to you the probability that the wave function peaks at some point. That is, they have a closed formula for that. And then there's semi-analytical understanding of how narrow it is, given that it is, for instance, picked at one of these points, okay? So again, these are exactly my epsilon parameters now here, no? These determine the coupling strengths to the boundary Higgs. So, um, This is not very sensitive to the, to the prior for your distribution no. for M and K? No, 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 it's not. So actually, the, uh, S, for instance, if you go to the cycle one case where the K and M have the same distribution, prior distribution, then the probabilities are very, um, are totally independent. The probabilities that you are, for instance, localizing at side two, at side three, et cetera. The width is a bit dependent. Yeah, that's, that's the width is dependent. That's what I was asking. Yeah, okay, so the width is dependent, but uh, for so this. Sort of a translation invariant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, disordered yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, No, no, that's, that's correct, no? So if you, if you, if you make, a, you know, a certain very prejudiced prior distribution, you could probably get a rather, yeah, and you can continuously deform it to the ordered case, no? Um, Is it just like the smallest MK? No, it's more complicated like than that. Neighbors or there's more it's, more, it's more complicated than that, yeah. Okay, um, so I should wrap up, I guess. Um, so I, I find this, this point very interesting now because it gives you an, an, an orthogonal interpretation of what's going on. So again, this is still for the one generation clockwork chain. What I've done here is I have uh, done a simulation of, all, of, of random uh, Ks and Ms, okay? And then I have separated each 
solution of the wave, zero mode wave function into bins. Now, the bin word, word peaks here, the bin word peaks here, the bin word peaks here, and then I average in each bin to get something smooth, okay? So this are, let's say, the, the typical wave, so for instance, this would be here, the typical wave function of, the, of, of all the guys that localize around side five, okay? So this gives you, uh, so this is for the uniform prior, okay? For the uniform prior, so that then you can see how, clo how narrowly it localizes. Note that there's a log scale here, and also it's a very local, very narrow localization. So this is the average, would be the, each of these curves is the average wave function of all the zero modes in your simulation, which localizes at side zero, side one, side two, et cetera, okay? So this is just to give an, give an idea of how, how narrow these guys uh, localize, okay? It depends on the prior, that is for sure, okay? That's for uniform prior. These dots here are the, the actual probabilities that the localization occurs at each um, of these sites, so you can see it's a bit more likely that you localize at the boundaries than you, that you localize at the, at the bulk, okay? This is for 10 sites. And these, again, these values here are the epsilon parameters or the averages, okay? Now, what do you want to do is you want to make a connection to the three generation uh, case, and that's the last thing I show. So this is the same thing done for the three uh, generation case, but instead of binning now according to where it peaks, I just take three cases, the light, uh, the smallest eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue, and the medium eigenvalue, okay? So you see the smallest eigenvalue now of this has a wave function which tends to be localized towards the other boundary, even though it doesn't have to peak there, so that's not visible here. It could peak here, it could peak here. That's washed out in this, in this averaging. Then this is the largest eigenvalue that's close to one. It peaks obviously close to this boundary. That's where it has an unsuppressed coupling. And then the other guys, they're kind of, is washed out here. You know, they can localize anywhere, okay? So what you have is a kind of, uh, this, this, this model that I was presenting to you could be inter interpreted as a spontaneous separation of certain of the, gen of, the, of the wave function of, this gener of each generation in, in theory space, okay? Oh. Sorry, you're telling us this is like the top, uh, well, I guess the top quark. Blue. Uh, the yes, second. would be blue. So then, then so I, I would interpret this as the top quark, this as the, uh, the up, and this as the char, okay? All right, so let's wrap up. Sorry, in your yeah. original picture then, as I debate out this stuff, there's only one of the guys that's truly localized uh, at, at, that, at that point, the Q-naught Q picture. Uh, yes, so the Q-naught pictures, this is not the wave function of the Q-naught. The Q-naught is the value, uh, it's, it's, a, it's the guy that lives at this, at this, um, at this side always, no? The Q0 is not a mass eigenstate, so sorry, that was not your question. And I, I, I thought it was supposed to be close to the, the, the massless guy. Uh, no, it's very, it can be very different, actually. It can be very different, yeah? It's, it's, it's this, so it could even be this guy, no? It could even be that guy. It's very unusual, but I just chose to, to not use the mass eigenstates to, to, to do the question. Because you integrated stuff out. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me let let me let me. Uh, and so, so what are the yeah. So what's left what's is the field yeah. On the left, I I guess I switched sides here. Maybe that's what's confusing you. So here the zero mode. Sorry, not the zero mode. The zero side appears to the left. In my original picture, appeared to the right. I mean, Was that what? Q not or is it Q not tilde? Uh, Q not. Q -not tilde? So yeah, let me see. Let me. See. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which maybe. Is, yeah. Guess, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I think at some point I switched sides. No, at the beginning, the side zero appeared to the right. And here in these plots... The sides aren't confusing. Okay. I, I thought all three generations are supposed to live mostly... Uh, no, on no, the no. They are, they are like this. So, so depending what you, what you talk... So the, the three generations of... Okay, so I, let's talk about yeah, that after. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Okay. 
So conclusion, so the very hierarchical structure of the Fermi mass and mixings of Earth and Sun can arise randomly and very naturally from products of several matrices. Um, then uh, we have, I constructed some explicit models with this property, which predict some vector like fermions with the standard model quantum numbers. We can relatively easily with few uh, continuous parameters of order one or two, uh, well, or order one or two continuous parameters, no? Uh, accommodated experimental data. Uh, the vector-like mass case should be at least a TeV just from the lepton sector, okay? And I'm working on the quarks. Um, and this last part, the mechanism can be interpreted as a spontaneous separation of the zero-mode wave function theory space, okay? Similar to Anderson localization in condensed matter. Sorry for the overtime. Yeah, yeah, yeah.